New York, New York, October 14, 1927. Nearly 50 blocks wear past my cab window as I ride through the upper reaches of Manhattan from the Hotel Olga in Harlem, traveling toward the Upper East Side. I feel as though somewhere I've crossed an invisible line. The shadows of the complexions fade from colored to white. Not that it matters to me. I have never been hindered by the views and prejudice of others, not even the Ku Klux Klan. My cab stops in front of a limestone how townhouse amidst the expanse of brick facades, facades on East 65th Street. I exit the cab, then pause before I mount the few steps to the front door. The number is 47, is on the left of the raw iron gate, which, while 49 is on the opposite side. Yet, there is only a single entrance. Odd, I think. And a bit confusing to have one door for two residences. I certainly hope Mrs. Roosevelt gets along with her neighbor. The door is opened by a young woman wearing a white colored. For a moment she stands still, her eyebrows raised, and her blue eyes wide with astonishment. I am Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune, here for the luncheon, I said. She recovers. Yes, ma'am. As she gestures for me to enter, her face becomes once again the expressionless servant's mask. Chatter and laughter flowed in from the hall. Ma'am, she said, reaching for my coat. I shrug out of my black fur collar wrap and put my hat to, to make sure it hasn't tilted. The young woman leads me down a hallway darkened by mahogany panels. As we approach the sound of voices, I listen to the medley of tones, searching for the accents and annotations that will give me clues as to who these women are and where they are from. When I step into the drawing room, the gleaming chandeliers, the velvet burgundy drapes, framing the large windows, the deep chintz sofas, and a crackling fire after a warm, warmer welcome than the women inside. Unfazed, I move to the walls covered with bookcases, glorious leather-bound volumes line the shelves, and how much my curious students at Bethune-Cookman College would enjoy and appreciate a library like this. If I didn't know this was a luncheon for women leaders of national clubs and organizations, some of the most powerful women in America. Fashion show. Each woman wears a different variation of the latest style. There are skirts and sweater sets and drop waist dresses, and all, of course, are wearing silk stockings. Quite the contrast with my ankle-length navy dress trimmed in velvet. Peruse the bookshelf, noticing the conversation dips to a whisper whenever I skirt close to a group. As I draw near women, I recognize from my position as president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. I smile and nod, but I only occasionally receive a nod in return. Then my acknowledgments are met with steel-cold glances. Funny how the same women who talk with me about the advancement of women in a formal meeting space open to whites and Negroes pretend not to even see me in this social setting. Instead of allowing this to to smart, I read the titles as I survey the books, a biography here, a novel here, a historical study in between. Ah, Dr. Bethune, what a pleasure. My smile widens as the officious-looking Mrs. Sarah Delano Roosevelt approaches, surprisingly light on her feet for her seventy-something years. It's good to see you again, Mrs. Roosevelt. You as well, Dr. Bethune. I hesitate, then say, I hope you're, you'll pardon me for clarifying. I pause, and Mrs. Roosevelt's expression hardens. She's not used to correction. I prefer to be called Mrs. Bethune, although I am grateful for the recognition. My doctorate degree is an honorary one. I prefer that honorific be reserved for the men and women who work hard for, to get their doctorates. As you wish, Mrs. Roosevelt's voice softens at the benign nature of my clarification. Please tell me, I understand you'll just return from Europe. How was your trip? It was the most glorious eight weeks. Isn't Europe amazing? So full of history. Leaning closer, she whispers, Did I hear you had an audience with the Pope? The astonishment of her tone matches the amazement I felt standing before Pope Pius VI and receiving his blessing. As we talk about the Vatican, I wonder how news of my travel spread so fast and so wide. But of course, I say nothing about that, and when Mrs. Roosevelt asks the purpose of my trip, I tell her I traveled to Europe with Dr. Wilberforce Williams, the noted public health care expert and writer. He's a friend from Chicago who's been to Europe several times, and while we arranged a travel group, I knew it was time for me to get an understanding of life across the ocean. 
We chat about our experiences in Europe, especially the beautiful gardens. I love Kew Gardens in London in particular, Mrs. Roosevelt says. They have the largest botanical collection in the world, you know. Oh, yes, I say. I found it lovely as well, but I preferred the black roses in Switzerland. Black roses? Oh, my, she says with a I don't think I've ever seen such a variety. A butler approaches and whispers to her. It seems I am needed for a matter crucial to the luncheon. Will you excuse me? I am left alone once again and find myself facing a cluster of three women. I can imagine their thoughts, wondering what on earth I have in common with the society matron, mother to former assistant secretary of the Navy, and failed vice presidential candidate Franklin Roosevelt. He had been considering a promising politician on the rise until polio felled him six years ago. But I am not here because of him. The women and I catch one another's gazes, and I smile. When I'm rewarded with cold shoulders once again, I resume my preambulation, letting my favorite walking stick lead the way. I do wonder which of these women is Mrs. Roosevelt's daughter-in-law. Her name was on the invitation, and she is my host as well. I long to meet Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, who has become an advocate for the unrepresented and one of the most prominent women in politics, albeit for the Democrat Party. From what... I've read she alone among the women in this room show promise.